Oh man, we got this great story in the gospel today, don't we? In this Feast of the Epiphany, we hear about these mysterious figures called the Three Wise Men. And uh, this star, what is that all about? Often we get made fun of or criticized um, as Christians, as Catholics, for these kinds of stories. They seem silly or fairy tale ish, right? But the church teaches us that the Gospels are to be taken historically accurate as historical occurrences, unlike Genesis, which is to be read more metaphorically, revealing to us some truth about ourselves and our God. But the Gospels are different, the genre, right? And so what is this all about? Is there historical evidence for it? Yes, there is, in fact, and I'm going to go through that this morning. But I also want to encourage us all to think about ourselves as one of those three wise men. I'm going to go through that and say, you know, how, how are our lives like theirs? How is our journey to Jesus like theirs? Because I think there are some, uh, some similarities uh, for sure. Let's start with these magi, because that's the word that's used in the gospel, magi. Uh, that word translated means wise men. And we get the word magician from it even. Um, were these historical figures? Were th did they exist in reality? Yes, they did. Um, magi were most likely philosophers, astrologers, or astronomers. And we have some historical documentation concerning these figures. For instance, in the uh, first century, the Roman historian, uh, Pliny the Elder, writes about this convoy coming from the east, um, a king named Tiridates, of Armenia, and he's bringing with him magi. And he's also bringing with him about 3,000 people. And they're going to Rome in the year 66 to see Nero. Nero, not a good emperor, okay? But they go and visit Nero, and these magi bring him gifts. And he writes about when they go to Nero and see Nero, they prostrate before Nero and present him these gifts. For the Magi, Nero was a demigod, right? Divine and human. And they brought him these gifts. Now that's an historical account. So these Magi did exist, all right? And it tells us in the Gospel that they come from the East, that they go to find this newborn king to do him homage. All right, there you go. But on their way, right, they get to Jerusalem. Now, the Magi must have known, in fact it is um, documented as well, that at the time of Jesus, even with the Gentiles or the Goy, huh, there was a belief that the new king of the Jews would be born around that time. Okay? And in Jerusalem, of course. Uh, so they go to Jerusalem, thinking that that's where the newborn king is. And who do they encounter? Herod. Now, did Herod exist, or is this made up? Another one of these tales that we make, uh -huh, supposedly. Well, Herod existed, we know this with certainty. Herod was not a good man. Um, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian of the first century, talks about Herod. Herod was paranoid. He was basically a puppet ruler of that area, set up by the Romans. The Romans would set up puppet rulers in, in, in these areas, right, that they conquered. Well, Herod was one of them. He was not liked by anybody, essentially. And he was paranoid that his power would be taken. So he killed one of his wives and three of his sons and 300 of his bodyguards. Not a good guy. So when the wise men, these magi, get to him and they say, well, where's the newborn king? Herod is not happy. He's thinking, what's going on here? My power is threatened, right? And so he orders the slaughter of many innocent children within the town or city of Bethlehem. It is not Bethlehem. There was no ham in Bethlehem. It was a Jewish town. Okay? <laughs> Bethlehem. But um, they know that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Why? Because of Micah, Old Testament um, book. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 talks about the newborn king will be born in Bethlehem. So they know the town, all right? And uh, the three wise men then make their journey to Bethlehem. But all the meanwhile, what are they following? 
this light, this, this star, this star, all right? What is that? We don't know. We don't know. Was it an actual star? Was it uh, a planet? Was it a comet? Well, those are some theories. In fact, there's a wonderful um, book out concerning this. Uh, Cambridge, University of Cambridge scholar and professor. You got all the, a lot of uh, uh, the, the best astronomers of the world together. And they wrote this book called The Great Christ Comet. Now, he hypothesizes that it was a, it was a comet, not a star. What do we know about comets at the time of Jesus? Number one, they were omens or signs of kings being born. We know that. Two, um, they would stay visible as long as 14 months in the sky, even during the day. Three, uh, they often, at the tail of the comet, could look like it was pointing towards something, or someone. So that, that's a theory, all right? That's one of the theories. But there's another one that I find a little bit more uh, convincing. The, many of the ancient church writers, the church fathers, who were brilliant, they thought, when they wrote about that it was an angel. An angel. Often, but you see in the Old Testament, angels re being referred to as stars. And stars being referred to as angels, okay? So... There's an indication there that perhaps this is something um, not purely a phenomenon uh, of astronomy, but a supernatural thing, okay? And this would also explain why that it was moving and it would go over directly the house of Mary and Joseph where they were. Because if you follow, try to follow a star in the sky, that ain't going to lead you to too, too many places, right? You can go everywhere. So I think I'm, I'm with the church fathers on this, okay, which is good to be with them, all right? And so that would kind of give us some historical background here, folks. It's important to realize that these things actually happened because in the modern world, we get a lot of uh, criticism, and we need to be able to respond to those and to think critically about our faith because it's real. We shouldn't be afraid of thinking critically about it and saying, okay, let's look at this, right? Now, why is this all important, this whole story? First, I think it's important to realize our faith is rational, our faith is true. But I think we can look at ourselves as one of those three wise men. We look towards a light, and that light is Jesus. And we're on a journey to find him, to encounter him, to adore him, to be with him. But sometimes along the way, we have a Herod, a Herod who tries to destroy that. Now, we can think of Satan, certainly a lot more evil than Herod, and Satan is real. I was talking to an exorcist the other day just about some of the demonic activity he's encountered. But Satan is real. He's a fallen angel. He's very smart, very smart, but we shouldn't fear him if we're with God. But he tries to tempt us away like Herod from that light, from the ruler, who should be the ruler of our lives, our hearts. So those temptations come in. Sometimes it's our own weakness due to original sin. So, for instance, if we think that money or things can bring us that light in our hearts, that meaning, that depth of peace, or if we think that um, uh, promiscuity, right, or that if I just throw off these rules of the church and the faith, then I'll be truly free and happy. Boy, that leads us away from the light of Jesus. And we can find then death and destruction, spiritual death. So on our journey, there are things against us that can happen. We have to carry on, carry on towards that light of Jesus. And when we find Christ, and this can be we find him every hour, every day, okay? We can find him more than just once, right? It can be an ongoing encounter. Every day we make that journey to Jesus. Just take it day by day. And say, today I'm going to find the light of Jesus. For instance, we're here this morning on Sunday to worship Jesus. We are here to adore him like the three wise men. 
and we come bearing gifts for Christ, at least we should, right? We come bearing gifts, we come bearing our hearts, our voices of song and worship. We come bearing our checkbook, our money, that's true. Why do you think we bring up the gifts uh, forward? Well, we used to, out of COVID, but we bring up the gifts of the money and the wine and the, and the, wa and the bread. We're presenting gifts to God. But what we get in return is so much better, isn't it? What we get in return is so much better. We get a sense of, of peace. We get Jesus, the King of our hearts. And you note something here. The three wise men go back by another way, right? After they encounter Jesus, it says in the Gospel, they departed for their country by another way. Now here's, here's what's going on. They encounter this light of Christ, the Son of God, and they are forever changed, see. They go back by another way. They're not, they don't go back to the old way of life. They go to a new way. Every time we encounter Jesus, especially in the Eucharist at Mass, we need to be changed, open our hearts to receive that light, to go back by another way, to go back in a way of greater charity towards the poor, towards our family, greater life of prayer, adoration. So we rejoice today, my dear brothers and sisters, on this Feast of the Epiphany. It really did happen. And let us pray that we may, like those three wise men, search diligently for that light every day and go back by another way.